Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Tenement Museum Book Talk with Jennifer Egan. Uh, my name is Katie Baker Barracks. I'm the Associate Director of Visitor Services for the Tenement Museum, and I'm so glad that I could be with you virtually tonight. Thank you for tuning in. Um, before we get started, if you're watching this event live, you are welcome to ask questions and make comments throughout. Um, you can use the chat feature in YouTube for that. Um, we will be having a specific section at the end of the program for questions. Um, that we get throughout the program. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Tenement Museum, we're a museum that tells the stories of immigrants, migrants, and refugees in the United States located on New York's Lower East Side. We are not currently having any programming on the ground, um, but we are doing events um, and we are doing virtual events that you can find at our website, www.tenement.org. Now, to get to what we're all waiting for tonight, I'd like to introduce all of you to Jennifer Egan, the renowned author of The Invisible Circus, Look at Me, The Keep, A Visit from the Goon Squad. And tonight we're gonna to be focusing on her most recent novel, Manhattan Beach. I'm going to very awkwardly share my screen this time. And then I'm gonna let Jennifer introduce us to this wonderful novel, Manhattan Beach. So just give me one second. All right, shall I start? Go for it, Jennifer. Um, okay, I need to get out of full screen mode so I can see my notes. There we go. <laughs> uh, the little problems we have to deal with nowadays. Um, thank you all for coming. It is wonderful to, um, to be here and to talk with you about this museum, which helped me enormously at a certain point in my research. And I thought in order to explain that, I would just sort of talk about how I started and the way in which research generally contributed very directly to what ended up being the story of Manhattan Beach and how that research led me to the Tenement Museum. Um, I began sort of dabbling in World War II New York long before I actually put pen to paper and I do write my first drafts by hand. So it was pen to paper uh, in 2012, years before that, while writing a visit from, actually while writing The Keep. So even one before a visit from the Goon Squad, I got interested in learning about what New York was like during World War II. And I started by just kind of immersing myself in imagery. And what I found was that the water, the waterfront was, was omnipresent. Um, and I began to realize that in a way the, the center of the city really was at its edges at that point commercially. So I thought, okay, so writing about World War II New York is writing about the waterfront. And that, and so I began to learn more about the waterfront, which led me to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which was an incredibly important shipbuilding facility, um, shipbuilding and ship repairing facility in Brooklyn, um, actually right into the 1960s. And in my eagerness to learn more about the, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and especially the women who work there, I got involved in an oral history project in which I and the Brooklyn Historical Society and the Brooklyn Navy Yard all partnered to interview anyone and everyone we could find with um, World War II experience at the Navy Yard. And of course, this was in the first decade of the 21st century, mercifully. So people were, more people were living with those memories than are today. Um, and I think that's an important point to make. You know, this is a period that is really disappearing from living memory every day. Um, and so during those, and, I, and it wasn't just people who had worked at the Navy Yard, really any elderly New Yorker that I learned of <laughs> with a good memory, immediately found him or herself speaking into my tape recorder. So, um, so, and in the course of those interviews, I again and again found myself getting a richer and richer sense of what Tenement New York was like. And, you know, Tenement New York in a certain way was New York. I mean, the building stock that New York is made of um, and was and was you know constructed of in the 19th century is row houses that are often quasi identical at least they they usually exist in clumps um, built at the same time um, with you know five stories I think was the legal maximum but some of them would go up to six by calling the ground floor floor zero. Um, 
And I wanted to get a sense of, of what that life was like. And it kind of trickled through in all of these different interviews. Uh, just to give you a few examples, I learned that although the mores governing female behavior at that time were very strict, in fact, children growing up in tenement New York were largely unsupervised, played on the street, and um, and were and, and and in fact, there was a great deal of sexual activity. Katie, I'm just wondering if it might make sense for me to actually for them to be able to see me as I'm talking. Um, just seems like that might be more interesting for them than just looking at the book cover. Uh, just a thought. Um, anyway, uh, so that was one thing, sort of sexual activity among young people, which was not supposed to be occurring, but it inevitably did. Uh, another one was just the kind of close proximity of sometimes large families living in small apartments, one on top of the other, and the way in which families became intertwined. Um, that came up a lot in these, in these conversations. One thing that ended up being very important, actually, in the plot of my book, those of you who have read it will know, is that again and again, I would hear of people who couldn't leave home because of a physical disability that was just too difficult to manage with all of the stairs. And, you know, if you think about Row House, New York, there are very few accommodations, in fact, really none, uh, for a person who can't walk up and down many, many flights of stairs. And that, and, and not only did certain people have to stay home for that reason, but often another person would stay home with them. So this had a big impact on family life. Um, and of course, also, you know, having babies, um, you know, maternity, all of that stuff. Um, but especially the idea of someone who couldn't walk and what that would be like. Um, homemaking routines were, came through all the time in these interviews. I remember there was one, um, there was a woman from an Italian family uh, named Carmela Zuza. And she talked about how her father would actually make wine. He would store fruit in the basement in big bins and he would actually make wine in their apartment. And there were even people who grew, you know, tried to grow grapes. I mean, um, Brooklyn was very fertile, um, lots of farms here uh, in the 19th century and even into the 20th century. So there was a lot of growing, although often the area in back of, um, of row houses was, did not consist of backyards um, as it often does now, but it was where laundry was sometimes washed and, and certainly hung to dry. So just those kinds of homemaking routines were really of interest to me. And then another element that I'm gonna mention, although it does not pertain to Row House New York particularly, was just the presence in so many people's lives of organized crime and organized crime figures. Um, these were often people who were active in neighborhoods and it was kind of understood that they were quote unquote gangsters, which in the World War II years and, and, and you know in some decades before that was a kind of quasi acceptable job description in, in a way that I think we can pretty clearly say it no longer is. Um, but you had quote unquote gangsters living in fancy buildings. Um, and this was all the result of prohibition and the fact that quote unquote gangsters, and I only use the quotes because it could mean so many different things, uh, began really as bootleggers. And since everyone still wanted to drink, they were accept not only accepted, but actually somewhat welcomed <laughs> into polite society. So this issue of, of gangster life would come up a lot as well. Um, and so I, at a certain point, I, I, now I myself had lived in tenement buildings um, from 1987 when I got to New York until 1995. But there had been enough renovations in those buildings that even, even though I myself was in a somewhat crowded building with, with some very elderly people, uh, this would have been from 1990 to 1995 in the East Village, elderly people, who some of whom had even raised their families there, I felt like there was something about the physical plant that I was missing. And that is what led me to the Tenement Museum, which I had visited as a tourist, um, but not as a researcher. And now I'm going to let um, Katie take, take it from there and show you some slides, and then I can talk about how those, uh, those elements of the museum helped me.
Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so I'm gonna take us on a very brief kind of tour of the Lower East Side in the 1940s um, and the Tenement Museum building. Um, very quickly to kind of give you a little bit of the imagery that um, Jennifer used in her research um, and that many of you can experience once we reopen again. So I'm gonna again, very awkwardly share my screen. Just give one second. All right, so this is an image of the Lower East Side in the 1940s. And I just wanted to start us off a little bit with what would be going on in the streets of just a regular neighborhood in New York City in the 1940s. Um, so we can see here that the streets are pretty muddy. There might've been snow. This picture was likely taken in the wintertime as we can see from the trees. So there was snow slush um, and the irrigation, the drainage wasn't so great in the streets right there. But we can also see that there's a lot of active commerce going on. We can see cars in the streets. Um, so we're seeing the, and also it's just this great black and white photo which lends this very noir quality to 1940s New York City. Um, and I have a second image here, also of the Lower East Side in the 1940s. Again, just to give us a brief look at what the streets, what outside the buildings would have looked like at the time. Um, again, I'm assuming that this is taken in the winter after it snowed, because again, there's kind of some slush in the street, the infamous slush of New York City. Um, and you can see that the awnings are down in the photo as well, so that people would have taken them down to not get snow accumulation on them. And again, you have people actively walking around, you have commerce going on, you probably have people going to and from work and also going to and from their homes at the same time here. Because I'm now gonna introduce the building, 97 Orchard Street. So this is not a picture of 97 Orchard Street in the 1930s. Now, when I said that people were probably going to work and coming home, um, as you can see, 97 Orchard Street is a mixed use building. There's actually four shops on the bottom of the building and then the upper floors are, which you would walk up the staircase to, are uh, all apartments. Um, and there would be four apartments on each floor. And I think it's really going to give a sense of when you read Manhattan Beach, you can see how small these spaces were. Um, and I think especially about thinking about a character like Lydia, um, who is disabled, like what living in this space would be like. So and we're gonna go inside 97 Orchard Street. So this is the hallway um, and the staircase here. And you can see it's a very narrow wooden staircase. Um, if you look to the left in the photo, um, you can see the um, restrooms for the floor. So there were two restrooms per floor. Um, and when 97 was built in 1863, um, it didn't have any indoor plumbing. This is actually added on in 1905. Um, the toilets. It also didn't have any electricity um, when it was first built. Um, the family that we're going to be visiting, the Baldizis, um, which was a big part of the research for Jennifer, for her book, um, or at least a small part of the research for her book, um, uh, they lived here in the 1930s. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the um, updates to the building. Um, the building was found in 1988. It had not been inhabited since 1935, which to Jennifer's earlier point about living in these buildings in the 1980s, a lot of them had been updated with different housing code laws. And while the Tenement Museum, 97 Orchard Street, had also been updated with some, um, it hadn't been updated with anything past 1924. So the building got electricity in 1924. Um, and that was the last major update. It was actually closed in 1935 due to another update in the housing code law where they were requiring the banister and stairs to be replaced with metal instead of wood. Um, and so the landlord at the time decided that they didn't want to make those improvements. It was more financially responsible for them to close the apartments, um, but keep the businesses running. So because the businesses were still running and they were renting those out, the upper floors basically were sealed for about 50 years. Um, until two ladies came and found the museum in 1988 and they started the process of converting it to a museum, not for it to be a historic home museum, but for it to really tell the stories of immigrants, migrants, and refugees who lived in this building. So it, it was really to show people how people lived. Um, and now we're gonna go in to the Baldizzi apartment. Um, so this is the apartment of um, Adolfo and uh, Rosaria Baldizzi. Um, and they lived here with their two children. 
Um, and as you can see here, there's a couple of elements um, that if you read Manhattan Beach, you will hear about. So um, this is a tub sink that you can see that's actually covered right here, right now. So this is a large basin um, where you could actually bathe children in it right next to the sink. Um, obviously, it was space that you didn't want to waste um, when it wasn't in use, so you would cover it. And you have different elements of the kitchen there as well. Um, you can also see the gas box that is up there. So you paid per use for your gas. Um, so if you've ever watched uh, silent movies, you'll see sometimes that they'll like do the frozen quarter trick or the frozen coin trick where they'll try to put it on a string and then pull it out or put an ice chip in. Um, and you can see one of those in the top left corner here of the image. Um, one of the things about the Baldizzi apartment that is um, tells a lot that's very similar to how Jennifer constructed Manhattan Beach um, is that the story of the Baldizzi's, the primary source for this story is actually the oral history of their daughter, Josephine Baldizzi. So oftentimes with the um, residents of 97 Orchard Street, one of the primary sources we have is the census. Um, but the Baldizzi's were not on the 1930 census. Um, if you come and you visit the museum, you can find out a little bit more about why they may have made that choice to not be on the census. So we have this very rich, detailed oral history from Josephine Baldizzi um, in the 90s that she gave to the Tenement Museum. And she actually appears on multiple tours because she had a very vivid memory um, from living here as the child. And her oral history was corroborated with other residents who were on the 1930 census. So we know that they lived in the building. But oral histories are a really important way that the museum gathers and tells the histories of the people who lived here. Uh, and I know it was such an important part of Jennifer's research into Manhattan Beach as well, because they, they really give us life and detail that we wouldn't know. And next we're gonna go to everyone's favorite, the shared toilet in the hallway. So one of the things to keep in mind when you're thinking about these spaces is that they are going to, people are gonna be in your business. Um, because the hallway and the stairs are a shared space. Um, the toilets are a shared space. So you're going to be running into your neighbors. Your neighbors are going to know about your life coming and going. And there's a couple of moments in Manhattan Beach where Anna thinks about this. And I actually thought about the hallways. Like she thought about what her, like how to maneuver, like maneuver herself around her neighbors. Um, and we talk about that on our tours. We talk about the fact that the hallways are a very public space. Um, so you're going to kind of get your get the business and people are going to know your business in the hallway. Um, this is another image from the Baldizzi apartment. So this is actually the parlor. Um, I should back up and say that um, the apartments in 97 Orchard Street are roughly 325 square feet. Um, they were slightly larger when the building opened in 1863, but due to some of the updates in the housing code, um, including the addition of the toilets in 1905, which I'm sure everyone was happy about, the apartments got slightly smaller. So everyone on, the, on this call should think about living in a 325 square foot one bedroom apartment. Um, and this, if you're looking at this space here, you can see that this is a mixed use space um, because we can see a bed frame on the left here. So um, Adolfo and Rosaria actually slept in the parlor. Their children used what was considered the bedroom in the apartment as their room and they slept out here in the parlor but obviously during the day, they want to have it set up so that they can be together as a family, they can entertain people. So they would have the bed be taken down so that they can convert the room into a space where they can see other people in. And then finally, this is the um, Baldizzi kitchen, which is a, a real common space and a real space where people come together. Um, and I'm going to let Jennifer take it from here and talk a little bit about her journey to the Tenement Museum. Um, and I think this is a perfect place to end on because there's a lot of scenes in Manhattan Beach that take place in the kitchen. And Jennifer, would you like me to stop the slideshow or do you want me to keep it up while you talk? Um, why don't you keep it up because I'm gonna talk for a couple of minutes and then I'm gonna read. And I think it'll be, it will not be a bad thing to have that image there while I'm reading. So just to say, you know, as I said, I, I had personal experience of, of tenement buildings, two different ones, and I had heard all of these descriptions of them, and yet I felt like I couldn't quite locate my family in a specific apartment. <laughs> and this was a problem because a lot of scenes to actually take place in that apartment, especially during the 1930s. So when I walked into the Baldizzi apartment, I, I felt a tremendous sense of relief because I felt like I had 
arrived at an apartment that was preserved from exactly the period I was trying to reach for and the, and and had the proper um, you know the proper machinery and the the proper level of home um, technology and I felt like I had sort of arrived home in a way and a couple of things that I just want to mention um, the the kind of poignant and lovely little details of the front room I would often hear about people's parents putting the kind of treasure the family treasures into the front room this was you know as Katie said a mixed use room but but when company came that's often where they went and that was where people put their little their finery and you can see the little um, the, the whatever that is inside the oval there some artwork there's a, a lovely kind of lighting fixture um, usually there were curtains on the windows and so that was very um, sort of that felt exactly right to walk into that but the kitchen was the one, the kitchen and the hall toilet were ex incredibly exciting to me because although the tenement building I lived in had not really renovated the kitchens past about the 1950s, it was a world away from what you're seeing here. And those wash tubs where laundry was often done and then hung outside to dry were came up again and again. It's amazing how these wash tubs, you can see it right there past the sink, lived on in the memories of so many people. And I think they were quasi identical. Um, so it was exciting to walk into a kitchen that still had those. Another element that's interesting is the, is the way that you can look from the front room in, through a kind of window into the kitchen. And the scene that I'm gonna read to you sort of um, uses that. Uh, and then finally, I will just add, mention that I, I added a bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> the Baltices just didn't have quite enough space for me. So I did a little home renovation on their apartment um, and added a second small bedroom. So I am going to read a scene that I think you um, are basically looking at the setting for, although it, it takes place at night. And I don't think it really requires any um, explanation except to say that it's a scene that I, I wrote thinking specifically of this apartment. Anna heard her father's key in the lock and opened her eyes. From the density of silence outside the window, she knew it was very late, not even the bell of a streetcar. She tiptoed around the Chinese screen into the dark front room. There she paused. Her father was shirtless at the kitchen sink, soaping up his torso. Anna watched him, mesmerized. He couldn't see her from the lighted kitchen, and for an eerie moment, he appeared to be someone Anna didn't know and had no claim on, a gaunt, handsome stranger turning something over in his mind. When he left to use the hall toilet, Anna waited in the kitchen. He jumped at the sight of her in her nightgown. Then all of the worry seemed to leave him. He was himself again, and so was she. Toots, he said softly, what are you doing awake? waiting for you. He lifted her up, staggering almost to the point of losing his balance. From the medicine smell of his breath, she knew he'd been drinking. You're getting bigger, he said, steadying himself on the door frame. You're getting smaller, she said. He carried her a bit unsteadily through the front room to her bedroom door. That's the one I added. <laughs> The front room window shade was raised and her father leaned against the frame, still holding her. They gazed together into the dark. Anna felt the city stretching around them, reaching its streets and avenues toward the rivers and harbor. Hear that quiet, he said, speaking carefully as if on tiptoe. That is the sound of a harbor in a depression. No ships, she said, no ships. I hear a bird. No birds, please, not yet. But a solitary bird had begun to chirp a last holdout against winter. As if on cue, a tinge of light appeared in the eastern sky. You stayed out all night, she said, wonderingly. We can sleep until church. But he waited another moment, leaning against the window frame with Anna in his arms. How many more times would he lift her? Even now, she was almost too tall. I'm sleeping here, she said, folding her arms around his neck. Her father's skin smelled of ivory flakes from its recent wash. 
She rested her cheek on his bare shoulder and shut her eyes. And that's the kitchen where it happened. <laughs> that is so wonderful. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing at this point, Jennifer, so that you and I can get into a little bit of a discussion because I think that's a perfect ending point. And also, I think it'll be appropriate to segue into our conversation to talk a little bit about people leaving this apartment in the book. Um, because this leaving this space becomes such a transformational moment for so many characters. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing um, and welcome back to the non-sharing world here. Um, so one of the things I noticed in, in Manhattan Beach is that, and we, we do this at 97, which is probably one of the reasons I noticed it, is that we always talk about 97 Orchard as the unsaid character in the stories that we tell. Um, and I felt the same way about the Kerrigan's apartment in Manhattan Beach because the first person to leave is Eddie. He leaves the apartment and kind of, and I don't want to give too much away about what happens in the book. Um, and that becomes a moment for him where he just, he just vanishes from the women who live in that apartment's life. Um, and first of all, I'd like to say that um, men vanishing is not an untold theme uh, in that era which I'm not sure how many people are aware of, but it was actually so common that the Jewish newspaper, the Daily Forward, um, had a section called the Bintel Brief where they regularly had the missing husband's letters that came in to this column. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit. What's so interesting about your book is that Eddie reappears um, in the novel. And I want to get a little sense of like how that character came to develop, leaving and then coming back into the story. Well, we don't really know what's happened to him. Um, and I don't want to get too much into that, but uh, because uh, it's, you know, his, his destiny is, is a bit of a, a mystery in the book. Um, but as you say, the, the, an, another element that came up again and again in these oral history interviews was kind of parental abandonment all around. You know, Eddie grew up in an orphanage in the Bronx, which actually did exist. And, it, and it, I learned of it, it, it through my reading, um, various reading, and, and I think it was even mentioned in one of the oral history interviews. And what was so surprising was that many kids who lived in orphanages were not actually orphans. They were children in families where there was just not enough money and often the least favorite child or children would be placed in an orphanage. So talk about a traumatic start. Um, and Eddie is Irish American. Um, his his parents were Irish, and so he grows up in a in a milieu of of Irish, mostly Irish Catholic kids who go on to have uh, you know a handful of professions that were somewhat intertwined: uh, saloon keepers, police officers. Uh, gangsters, if you will. Um, and, and it was even possible sometimes to be sort of all three of those things, amazingly enough, and, and politicians. Um, so Eddie is someone who has a, a kind of a dream, he actually gets into the world of vaudeville um, and, and then becomes, is, is training to be a stockbroker when the stock market crash in 1929 happens. So he's a pretty troubled figure. I think we would say in current parlance that he is depressed. He has a lot of suicidal ideation and he is extremely miserable to have a severely disabled daughter. His daughter, Lydia, the sister of the, um, the girl that I was writing about just there is, um, I never diagnose her because there's no need to, but it seems fairly clear that she has some sort of cerebral palsy that makes it hard, impossible for her to walk, to talk really, or even to sit up. And for Eddie, this is a little like the, the straw that he just can't carry. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of pain packed into that little space um, and of course a lot of caretaking that has to go on for Lydia. Eddie disappears under unclear circumstances and then the women are left on their own and ultimately um, again not wanting to give things away uh, Anna, Anna ends up there basically on her own for a period which is something that would not, at that point she's in her 20s or 19 actually, absolutely considered adulthood at that time and an age at which some women would be marrying. Um, 
it would have been extremely inappropriate for a 19 year old girl to live alone before the war years. Um, and in fact, it, it probably still was slightly inappropriate, but so many women were living alone at 19 because their husbands had gone off to war that it, that it becomes possible. And, and on her own with a job at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, in this apartment, Anna's life moves in directions that would not have been conceivable when, as Katie points out, all the neighbors would have known her business. Uh, so it, it's a sort of, I mean, I think one reason I was drawn to the warriors generally is that it was such a liminal time. I mean, things that would not ever have happened before then, such as women being recruited to be welders and plumbers and electricians at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, were not only happening, but they had to happen. Women had to do this work. There were not enough men to do it. So it was a time when women and minorities too had opportunities, freedoms, um, possibilities that had not existed before. Uh, and it was a really interesting period to work with for that reason. That brings up such an excellent point because the characters you develop at the Navy Yard who we get to know are such a, I don't want to call them the misfits, but they, they do seem to be like, they stick together a little bit. And um, I'm just wondering, did you base those on real, like on actual people or were they an amalgamation of different people that you talked to? How did those those characters develop, especially of Merrill and um, uh, Bachman, Bachman, right? Bachman, um, yeah. Uh, they were because it's uh, they're so they're so rich in their in their relationship with Anna and in in the fact that they feel like they couldn't be in those positions beforehand. Well, I never base I'm I'm actually terrible at writing about actual people in my fiction. Um, this is a great relief to friends and family. I can assure you, uh, it can be kind of a drag because I wish I could. I, but for me, the, the people have to kind of appear and feel whole. However, I, in addition to the many oral history interviews that I was present for, I read a great deal more. Um, and I also read, there was a newspaper at the Brooklyn Navy Yard called The Ship Worker, which came out more and more frequently as the war went on. And I read every issue of that. Um, from the years leading up to the war and through the war, which gave me a pretty granular sense of what went on in the, in the yard day to day. In terms of the, the sort of misfit quality, you know, the truth is, especially among men, there was a great deal of anxiety about not being part, about not actually doing military service. Some men who worked at the Navy Yard were deemed es basically essential workers and were and that effectively was their military service. Um, but many of the men who worked there were working there because they couldn't serve in the military. And there was one really poignant oral history interview that I read, which was with a very young guy whose teacher, um, when he was a kid, had boxed his ears so hard that she had broken one of his eardrums. And that was a hazard in uh, warfare that involved gas because it could actually go it, through that broken eardrum into the brain. So he was not allowed to join the armed services. And this was such a source of pain for him. It was painful to read this interview because he was so insecure about it. And at the time that he was giving this interview, he was an old man. You know, the pain of not being able to do this and of feeling lesser because he couldn't had stayed with him all those years. Um, so so I, I guess I, you know, things like that really stayed with me and I brought them to the material. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of diving in Manhattan Beach, which we haven't really touched on because it doesn't pertain at all to the tenement museum or, or tenement life per se, but um, but I got very interested in diving and there was a diving tank and a huge civilian diving program at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And one of the, I interviewed a diver who actually dove during World War II. And one of the things he talked about, he was an army diver, but he wanted to be a Navy diver. And the reason he couldn't become a Navy diver was that his eyesight wasn't good enough. So I, I guess I was fascinated by all the aspiration that, that came through in these conversations. And it's no surprise, I mean, we're human beings. We're always measuring ourselves against other people. But 
you know, we look back and, and from my perspective, I'm just amazed that any of these people did any of these things. But what I would hear in my conversations with them and in transcripts of other conversations was the things they felt they should have been doing, the, the, the consciousness of rank. You know, when Navy officers would show up at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, everyone would snap to attention because it was largely a civilian population. So I guess, you know, in, in back to these two characters you mentioned, Bascom and Marl. Bascom is a guy who wants to be a Navy diver, but he his eyesight isn't good enough. So I lifted that straight from one of my own oral history interviews. And Marl is African-American, which meant that he didn't have any of the opportunities that, that he should have. Um, but, but, and Anna is a female, which was, you know, in terms of diving would probably have been prohibitive, um, based on sheer, you know, gender stereotypes. But my window of opportunity was that we don't actually know who participated in the civilian diving program. Women didn't do any military diving until the seventies, but Women weren't welders before World War II either. So these three are all using diving as a, as a, a means of trying to uh, improve their status in the world and get somewhere else. And they band together partly out of um, a sense of camaraderie in, in the fact that they have all been excluded in some way. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh out of this like necessity to um, to be in this place that they're not normally allowed to be in, they actually become very good divers. Like it's it's mentioned that Meryl is one of the best um, iron workers underwater <laughs> that they have. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, African Americans and women at the Brooklyn Navy Yard astonished everyone with their abilities. Um, I know that women, for example, were not allowed on ships for the first couple of years that they worked at the Navy Yard, if you can imagine. Um, they, the fear was that in the enclosed spaces of ships, men would not be able to control themselves. Um, when I was doing that research, I thought, ha, huh, what a ridiculous idea. But then ha Me Too came along and I realized that that was actually a more realistic concern, uh, you know, and, and remains so even into the present day more than I realized. But ultimately, they the women were, were allowed and actually brought onto the ships because their work was needed there. And, and physically, they were better equipped to work on ships than men. They tended to be smaller. They were often more limber. Um, and in terms of welding and, and burning and doing electrical work and plumbing on ships, those qualities were incredibly important. Um, and so it was, it was kind of fascinating to see how women thrived and excelled and, and surpassed everyone's expectations of how well they would do. But then there was a very poignant aftermath to that, which is that they were all fired. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, the African-American women as well, Maybe the African-American men were allowed to stay. I don't know. Um, but the women were all fired but even before the war ended. And there's a woman I interviewed named Ida Pollock, who was a welder, very slight, um, extremely limber, and an excellent welder, which she, she talked about welding, I would say, sensuously, even in her 80s when we interviewed her. And she was a working class person who needed to earn money. And she wanted to, she didn't want to go back to the phone company or whatever she had been doing before she became a welder. She wanted to keep welding. So she applied for welding jobs after she was fired from the Navy Yard, having had tremendous experience and even seniority at the Navy Yard. And not only was she not able to get welding work, she was actually laughed at and treated with contempt every time she applied and she was hopping mad even in her 80s and at one point she said to me i would go over those bridges i would look at the at the, at the welding work it was terrible so she felt that you know her skills were um were ignored unjustifiably and that the bridges were worse for it they probably were i'm i'm just gonna go with ida on that one yeah. um, it was amazing. <laughs> um, we've received a couple of questions from the audience. Um, 
and some of this is pertaining to this research. So um, our first question is, is there anything in terms of research in any of your novels that you found interesting that did not make it to the final draft? Oh gosh, I mean, I would say, you know, 90% of my research is not in the book. And, and you know what? You should be grateful. <laughs> Because one thing I learned, actually, is that, you know, I always used to think, oh, historical novels, you know, the, the writer wants to show off how much they know. That's why sometimes there's more detail than I want to read. In fact, I don't, I think I wasn't giving the writer enough credit. It's actually a deeper problem than that, which is that I became so fascinated by the, the process of discovering more and more about life at that time and, and making connections among different things that people would tell me that I, my, my perspective on how much some of this would interest the reader was skewed. And I think it's possible that I should have removed even more detail than I did. I have not reread the book and I don't plan to, but I just have a feeling that if I had waited six more months and reread it, I may have pulled out a little more detail. I don't know. But the fact is, it becomes consumingly interesting. But, you know, there, there are a lot of passages in the diving manuals that I devoured from the 1930s that I do not burden the reader with. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, so it becomes hard to even mention like a particular aspect of research that I had to leave out. I will say one thing, there was a scene that I actually have on my website for that book, um, if you want to read it, but there is a scene in which it, it actually pertains to the, um, the tenement life. Anna is delivering a package for her mother who does sewing work in the kitchen as you can actually see that at the Tenement Museum. There's a, an apartment from an earlier period where a family is actually clearly making clothing in that front room, as well as using it to sleep and raise children and do all the rest. But Anna is delivering a package to a, a, a woman whose husband we know was injured in World War I and has a wound that, that can't heal. And Anna's a very curious kid. She actually, it, it, it turns out that the wife is not home when she brings the package and she goes into the bedroom and, and has an encounter with this man who ends up showing her his wound. It's kind of a wild scene, um, but, and I, I, I was very taken with it myself, but the truth is it just was not essential to the action. And in the end, I really try to cut all of that um, because even though in the moment it might seem fun or interesting, the whole, the pace starts to really slacken if, if I allow myself those indulgences. So that's, that's the, oh, that's the one that got, that had to, had to get away um, with a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of sadness on my part, but I think it was for the best. Um. I have to encourage everyone on the, on, who's watching us now, if you haven't read the book, um, please do, because the references you do leave in are just fantastic because they really pepper and make the time period. An example um, of one that I, I really adored was when um, Anna's mother, Agnes, and her, um, her aunt, Brienne, are always at the table and they're always talking about fallen show, showgirls um, and like fallen silent movie stars. Um, and it's just so appropriate to the time period. But I'm also wondering just the breadth of your research of like all the movies, all the newspapers that you've had to read to just get even these tiny little references that are made. Um, and also her, her father who was in vaudeville, you make some, there are some regular vaudeville acts um, that you, that are used later on in the book um, that are talked about. And it's just the scope of the research really comes through um, in the novel just because when you're reading it, you kind of just, it envelops you. It gives you the scene and the sense and it isn't distracting, um, which is really difficult to do. Um, and I'm just, I know it took you a really long time to write Manhattan Beach. Um, you know, it didn't, I mean, it, it took about five years, but I was researching long before that. And I'm so grateful. You know, interestingly, uh, again, vaudeville is not something I had even thought of. Um, or the or the follies, which come up again and again, the sort of showgirl culture. 
a lot of that came really naturally out of those oral history interviews. And interestingly, there were a, cu a couple of references to um, showgirls who also worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So, you know, in the way that, say, modeling, um, or at least here in New York, you, you know, you sort of encounter models, there are a lot of models running around, you can sort of spot them. Um, you know, the, the equivalent, I think, in the 19... 20s through 40s, let's say, would have been showgirls. You know, there was a lot of work for them. These these reviews were, you know, re remember this is before television, which is was one of the wonderful things about writing that period about that period. Movies were huge. It's not that there were no screens um, and or screen culture, but it required that you go out. So people were out a lot. And it was, it was fun to read about the lives of these showgirls, although they were often tragic and young celebrity can lead to tragedy at any time. Um, and all the things that you would expect, sort of abuse by older men, often, you know, substance issues, which were often alcohol at that time. Um, so it was, there were a lot, there were so many parallels to today, but my, Honestly, what what my rudder in 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 identifying the elements of culture that were likely to come up were the oral history interviews. And so when I would read them or hear them, um, I would just mark little cultural elements. And I was always very happy when the same one would come up more than once. That or and and three times was you know the whole the holy grail because you want that triangulation, that sense that. This is not something that just one person was thinking about. This is something that people were noticing and remembering and commenting on from all sides. It was a it was a cultural uh, touchstone, and that I found was the one aspect of writing a historical novel that was much harder than I expected because I figured, well, you can find out what cars people were driving, what kind of cigarettes they were smoking. That's easy. You can do that on Google. But what is much harder to identify is what people were remembering in the 1920s or 30s. What were people longing for? What were the what were the cultural memories that they shared and the cultural associations that anyone would have recognized at that time? You can't really get that from a history book, but oral history is very, very helpful. And honestly, so was fiction of the period including bad fiction. It didn't matter if it was good or bad. And I've read more crappy detective novels than you can imagine. Um, it didn't matter because the cultural references are all there. And I, I kept very systematic lists of them. I had a you know, very long document that contained every, every reference I found to um, you know, bars, addresses, um, uh, you know, alcohol people drank, hotels, expressions, toys that children played with. I mean, every single reference I could come up with, I would add to this, um, to this document. And when it came up more than once, I would note that. I have to ask, did you have a favorite bad novel from the time period? Um, uh, I, uh, let's see. I don't want to diss anyone's novel. Um, there were, uh, let me, I have to walk over to my bookshelf to, to answer that. And I feel bad walking away from the camera. Um, I mean, Mickey Spillane is terrible for the wrong reasons. There's a ton of misogyny in his books and the, the women are always like devouring succubus killers. Um, so that, I, I, he's the name that's jumping to me, but he was not, oh, oh, okay, I got it. Ellery Queen. Ellery Queen's, um, murder mysteries set in New York are fantastically helpful in terms of references. They're not especially good as murder mysteries. Um, but I didn't even care. I think of them so fondly because of all the cultural references. Very well put. Um, we have another um, audience question um, and it has to pertain with oral histories. Um, it says, you mentioned we don't have much time to gather more oral histories from World War II um, vets. Are there specific stories you think we should be exploring that we aren't? You know, I would say if you know a person in his or her 90s, talk to them. <laughs> I mean, the thing that's interesting is that 
I, I was a terrible oral history interviewer because I had, I was a journalist. And so I was always trying to get them to talk about the Brooklyn Navy era. That was, I was always trying to nudge them in that direction. That is not a good oral history interview. An oral history, history interview, and there are all kinds of, you know, conventions around it. You literally start with who were your parents? Where did you grow up? You're actually getting someone to tell you their story in their way. And it took me so long to just let go and let people share their most vivid memories. I, I would say, don't, don't leave out anyone. I mean, anyone with, with memories of that time who hasn't talked into a recorder should. <laughs> Oral history is an incredibly useful thing, and we're going to be relying on it more and more as the written documentation of our lives evaporates. I mean, how many physical letters are you writing or reading these days? You know, if you think about correspondence, I mean, I, I'm 57. I have massive quantities of letters that I wrote and that people wrote to me, and I'm not that old, but that's gone. So we, oral history is a habit and a practice that we all need to get very used to. We are going to need it. Researchers are going to need it. Fiction writers are going to need it. Um, and there's tons of interesting oral history going on. And it's taught much more in universities. I don't think I really knew what oral history was when I was going to college. Um, but it is, it's a really valuable resource. And I would just say to anyone with, who knows a person, who's elderly with a good memory, turn it on and let them talk. They will lead you to the interesting material. And actually, I'm gonna add one more thing because in a way, it's sort of paralleling the sense of the preciousness of that era in people's memories and the fact that it's disappearing from living memory. Tenement New York is also disappearing at an incredibly fast pace. I live in Brooklyn. And I am incredulous at how much of the old tenement stock has been torn down in the 20 years that I've lived here for high rises and modern buildings. So this, this era, which really was kind of physical, the physical plant of New York as it was built in its current form in the 19th century, it is really disappearing. So I feel like the tenement museum is all the more precious to remind us of how these buildings were used at their inception, how they changed over time, um, and, and really to keep a physical record of a kind of New York life that is disappearing. I mean, when my husband um, first moved to New York and he lived in a little East Village apartment in a tenement building, he still had a bathtub in the kitchen. It was incredible. I don't know if you're gonna find one of those nowadays. I mean, that is just a, a disappearing phenomenon. Um, but these, these physical traces of the way people lived, you know, uh, uh, many years ago are, are so important. Um, I couldn't agree more. I hope that this entire audience will come join us, especially when we can start doing walking tours again, because we also tell the stories of those buildings on the Lower East Side. Um, and when we're back in the building, of course, I hope all of you can come visit. But I think we have to you know, we have a few minutes left and we don't have any other questions right now from the audience. I think one of the things to address still is um, the moment we're living in now. Like we're talking about oral histories and I'm thinking about like the oral histories that are gonna be gathered from right now. Um, and I know people are already, there are definitely museums who are already setting up, gathering information about coronavirus, um, about the social justice movement around Black Lives Matter. Um, and I, I'm wondering, cause I know that Manhattan Beach was really inspired by, um, made you, you started reflecting on this era after 9-11. Um, and I'm wondering how, what you think of and what's in the future, what, what is in store both for your writing and I think for just literature in general at this moment, because of this moment. <laughs> it's such a great question. Um, I mean, it's true that I think in a way 9-11 inspired Manhattan Beach purely in the sense that I lived, I still lived in New York then as I do now. And it was very shocking uh, to see how quickly New York City really turned into a war zone. I mean, it happened in the course of a single day. And what we don't have in living memory anymore in America is 
is any kind of immediate sense of what it felt like to have war waged on our land. Um, and so that was very shocking for an, a, an American who had never seen or heard of that firsthand to witness. And it made me wonder what New York was like during World War II when I knew that, especially in New York, there was a tremendous fear of a, a sea or an air invasion, which it turns out was not was never likely, but it was a fear uh, and felt like a possibility. You know, we're in, now in a period of such tremendous convulsion that I think it's going to be a time that people like me in, you know, 80 years are <laughs> assuming that, you know, we've managed to, you know, c somehow curb the climate crisis and people are actually still living on our planet in 80 years. People like me are going to look back and think, wow, that was a time when everything turned upside down. Just as I thought about the World War II years, that is just an inherently fascinating time. You know, um, there has obviously been a tremendous upheaval in so many ways and, it, and it's all interconnected as it was during World War II. You know, African-Americans said, why the hell should we be fighting for this country and treated it terribly when we come home? And that was very legitimate. Um, it, the problem was not solved, but it's impossible to imagine the civil rights movement having happened or the, um, you know, the move toward gender equality that we saw in the 1960s, the women's rights movement. I think both of those in some ways were a consequence of the enormous change and, and convulsions that occurred during World War II. So it's fascinating to see. I mean, I, I look forward, I hope I live a very long time to see what the repercussions of this moment are. Right now we're all so firmly in it um, that, that and, and, and in a constant state of waiting, you know, what will happen with the election? What will happen with COVID? Will we actually have a, um, a vaccine. I mean, I've had COVID and I still don't even know whether I can get it again or whether I can still give it to other people. Um, so we're in such a moment of questioning that it's a little bit hard to get any perspective, even on simple things like, can we hold an event in November, much less what will artists make of this later? But I think for sure, it will be a fascinating period to revisit for exactly the reason that all that many of the rules that have been governing our lives for a long time have been thrown open to question. And on some level, that, that in and of itself is a good thing. Having hundreds of thousands of people die as they did during World War II, and that's just Americans, that is obviously a terrible thing. Um, so it's, it's not even a silver lining. It is, it is just a fact, and I guess a hope, that out of these convulsions will come some improvements in American life and, and in all of our global citizenry. I think we, we need to change, and, uh, and I hope we do. Um, that's such a, a beautiful point to make at the end, and I very much hope that you are producing work 80 years from now Jennifer, I hope you're going to some, they're gonna have to do some serious work on lifespans if that's going to happen. Um, you'll, you never beating, know. <laughs> you'll be beating Olivia de Havilland for being. <laughs> um, so we have one final question from the audience, um, and and I have one more question, and I think everyone's on their mind is, um, what are you working on now? I, the, the audience question is specifically, how is the uh, Goon Squad sequel going? <laughs> I'm working very hard on it, um, and I hope to turn it in in just a few weeks, um, and we'll see what happens. I mean, I you know, I think there's some fun material there. It's been interesting to follow some of my characters into the future. So I'm now sort of into the 2030s. And that's always a great challenge. Um, although very tricky at a moment like this, when, uh, you know, what the future will look like is, is so open to question. And yet, it's funny, it's actually sort of strange the way that when you imagine forward, it's, it's so often the case that I think we follow what 
Jane Smiley once called, and I, this always stuck with me, the energy of logic, um, by which I mean that I think fiction writers often anticipate things because they are inevitable. And so if we're imagining forward, we, we perceive some of those inevitabilities. And so oddly in this, in this new book, I have, I frequently have referred to an event that I was just calling the rupture, which meant some sort of before and after event that changed everyone's lives, but I don't name the event. That was already there. <laughs> so I don't know whether I'm gonna have to change very much actually um, in light of COVID. Um, but I guess the answer is I have really enjoyed working on it and I think there's some fun material but I don't really know whether it will all fit together in a way that will make people who love Goon Squad feel that I've really matched it. Um, but I, I, it's not a, not a healthy thing for me to worry about that because all I can do is, is you know, my best and try to please myself. So that's, that's what I'm doing. And I, I hope at the very least people will find some fun material to enjoy whether or not they've read Goon Squad. Uh, well, on, on that note, um, I personally can't wait for your next work to come out. Um, and I encourage all of you to go out and read Jennifer's books, um, specifically Manhattan Beach. You can order from The Strand, who we partnered with for this book talk. All of our book talks, we are partnering with a local bookstore. Um, so you can go to their website and order a copy of Manhattan Beach. And they might even have a copy of A Visit from the Goon Squad or any of the, uh, Jennifer's other books on hand that you can order along with it. Um, Jennifer, I wanna thank you so much for being with us tonight. This was really wonderful and delightful. And I wanna thank everyone who has been here with us um, tonight. Um, I encourage everyone to take care, stay tuned. We're gonna have more talks um, and thank you again. Thank you. And uh, I hope you guys can open soon and, uh, and that all of those who are listening will get a chance to visit the museum sometime. It's really special. Fingers crossed. All right, everyone, have a lovely evening. Good night.